say there are several misconceptions about AI and in principle, it's important to say that um, technology won't save us, AI won't save us, and AI systems can act beyond their program functions. So on one hand, AI has a huge potential and impact on our daily life, the way we work, because it will change our workflows and make those more efficient. But AI is not, uh, it's not neutral, it's not objective, and AI depends or is not independent from power relations. So it always reflects the value of people or companies who have created it, who have created and trained the algorithm. So for us at UNITAC, the United Nations Innovation Technology Accelerator for Cities, as part of the People-Centered um, Flagship Program um, from UN, it's important that we develop AI technologies um, that are people-centered or in a people-centered way. Um, what does that mean? That means we try to ensure that tools and technologies are inclusive and focus on a broader public, um, on a broader public interest, so that more people around the globe can positively benefit from their use. So our aim is to ensure that um, digital technologies based on AI are used in an inclusive way, and therefore we create open, transparent, and especially participatory digital approaches to create a meaningful impact using AI. I think there are many important and pressing questions, but I think one in particular is around the inclusive governance of AI and how it impacts setting standards for assessing risks, uh, civil society engagement and gender equality, for example. A lot of the processes that take place nowadays are driven by public or private sector, especially, and for other stakeholders uh, like civil society, there are some barriers for meaningful participation. Uh, it's complex, the process should provide input, uh, or it requires uh, some specific time commitments. There are also lack of funds for organizations and experts to commit their time and resources. And this less diverse governance approaching AI really increases the risks uh, and unintended harms uh, that can arise uh, for society. So it's really crucial for the governments uh, who procure these technologies to build the capacity uh, to establish participation of different stakeholders and make use the tools and mechanisms uh, that support this needed co cooperation in AI governance. Uh, and then to answer this question of, uh, of a inclusive AI governance, uh, governments can also look at different mechanisms. Um, one, for example, is sandboxes to help understand how regulations interact with new technologies, how uh, um, administrat ad administrative processes are affected, um, and then based on this feedback, refine such interactions. Um, so it's really important that they bring together uh, not only uh, the private and public sector, but really take this opportunity to include civil society and other actors uh, to ensure this reflexive governance approach uh, is really inclusive in providing sites that can enlighten uh, ethical and rights-based considerations. In, in our daily work at UNITAC, um, we develop concrete tools and systems that use data and that use AI in, I would say, innovative ways to support integrated urban planning and basic service delivery. Um, we focus especially on the Global South, um, therefore we use uh, mapping, spatial analysis, data visualization to support planning and decision-making processes and here it's important for us to, to, to bridge the gap between data and action. So I would like to give one concrete um, example or one pilot project we developed on behalf of UNITAC. It's a BEAM tool, the Building and Establishment Automated Mapper. This is um, a project um, we developed together with the Human Settlement Department in Itikwini in South Africa. And it's a tool um, for city planners that uses machine learning to accelerate the detection and spatial recognition of informal settlements um, based on um, aerial imagery. So the objective here was to, um, to develop a scalable approach to assist the city to improve its data accessibility and to automate their land mapping processes. 
here in this case, by better understanding um, the dynamics of informal settlements. So informal settlements are a phenomena all around the globe um, and they grow organically and sometimes really fast. So just as a background information, mapping and monitoring the growth of informal settlements is uh, a really time consuming process when it's done manually. But with the tool using AI um, to track this challenge or to tackle this challenge of, of, of ma mapping the growth, um, we can accelerate this process. For example, in the city of Etiquini, we can map the whole city in 72 hours. So here what the tool does or what AI does is um, technically speaking, it's um, quite simple. It's just trained to identify or to mark all pixels on aerial images that a model considers as part of a building. And then it detects um, the shapes of buildings, the urban footprints, and it provides the city with up-to-date records with GIS layers where informal structures are marked. So for example, here in this case of mapping informal settlements in order to be able to develop a pipeline of urban upgrading and basic service delivery, it's an urban challenge all around the globe and AI mapping tools can have here a really um, important impact. So uh, human rights and ethics uh, should be the baseline for, for responsible and inclusive AI governance. Truly responsible AI, uh, artificial intelligence systems they require a, a foundation of values and principles, including human rights and ethical principles as fairness, privacy, and accountability, for example. So the value of integrating human rights also lies in the fact that they are accepted and recognized by member states and stakeholders and provide a framework for understanding harms and impacts that AI systems could cause. Uh, in the sense, uh, both uh, human rights and ethics can be seen as complementary in AI governance in protecting individuals' well-being and interests. Uh, there are many debates uh, whether to consider ethics only or if human rights would be a better framework for due diligence. And I think it's important here to consider two things in these debates. Uh, one is that the ultimate goal is overall to mitigate risks uh, that AI can pose for society. And for that, uh, both concepts of ethics and human rights will add value in this within their own capacities. And uh, the second overarching goal is to ensure AI is developed responsibly, following the legion technical design processes, but also that the use of AI is based on a need and public value. And for that, human rights and the targets associated with the sustainable development goals can also provide the needed directionality for AI application that ensure it is more inclusive and leaves no one behind. I think academia has on one hand the obligation, but um, as well the privileged role to critically reflect on AI. So we can reflect as researchers on the potentials and build on the other hand, awareness about possible risk on AI. So academia has the responsibility to ask uncomfortable questions from a more, I would say, theoretical and ethical perspective or background. So we can questioning AI, pointing out risks and so on. But on the other hand, we have as well the responsibility to set up pilot projects to develop and test concrete AI technologies and practice in order to be able to, to provide feedback, to, to, to point out the weak points and develop those technologies further. Always related to what is needed and, and what is needed from, from the people's perspective. No? So what we do with UNITAC and as well the City Science Lab is applied research, bridging the gap between data and action. So this is really important um, when it comes to responsible AI. And I think ac academia as well has a more neutral part or is, can be a more neutral partner. And so plays as well an important role in setting up governance structures. So structures again for UNITAC should be people-centered. That means um, to develop governance structures within a participatory approach. And therefore we should involve civil society. That means people and communities who are affected or who will benefit from the use of AI technologies.
It is a changing of the team in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that's an ongoing process and we all always learn more about it. Uh, but being optimistic, um, I hope that the public debate around AI and its impacts on humans can promote more and more the understanding that technology is not neutral. Uh, as a person and individual in society, uh, ethics and human rights are fundamental elements that define what it is to be a human being as well. Uh, and when AI and other technologies may affect these fundamental elements, we really need to increase autonomy and knowledge to make better decisions. So I think um, in one sense, uh, one opportunity in these debates is to really uh, understand it better from an individual point of view as a human uh, to make these better decisions. Um, and this understanding that technology is not neutral is also important in people-centered smart cities. So uh, we can make, uh, uh, we can move away from supply-driven implementation of AI just for the sake of having technology to a more inclusive and responsible governance approach uh, in these uh, AI uh, systems and life cycles. So um, AI and uh, th other technologies can really be leveraged to sustainable urbanization and to improve the quality of life for people, making cities more resilient and inclusive.